Hey, Paul, are you in here? On the other side of the cans. That is a lot of soda, my friend. I'm trying to get ahead on episodes of my show. Who's got time to eat? Why don't you try Huel Black Edition? What's Huel Black Edition? It's a nutritionally complete vegan shake with 40 grams of protein and 27 vitamins and minerals in each two-scoop serving. A whole meal in one shake? Yeah, man. Each two-scoop serving of Huel has 400 calories and includes vitamin C, calcium, omega-3, vitamin B12, zinc, fiber, and more. Just mix it with water and you're giving your body everything it needs without having to think about it. It's also gluten and lactose free. Shake it up in 30 seconds and you're back to your day. That sounds appealing, but what's it taste like? I've tried meal replacement shakes in the past and they taste like a retirement home. I can actually speak to this one personally. Huel Black Edition is a meal replacement shake you'll actually want to eat. They sent us samples of two of their nine flavors, cookies and cream and salted caramel, and I went through both bags. It's quite literally the first time I've enjoyed a vegan protein shake. All right, I'm sold. How do I get some? Go to huel.com slash gsg to place your order. That's h-u-l-e dot com slash gsg, and first-time customers get a free t-shirt and shaker. Huel.com slash gsg. Done. Now, can we do something about these cans? I wouldn't. I'm pretty sure something's living in there. Get out. Hold hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Pass. Welcome to the Ghost Story, guys. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. And this is the show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun has set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 154, and we're coming to you from that tiny mountain cabin you dream about, but can never quite reach. Paul, my friend, how are you? I'm okay. I have done more exercise this January already than I did last year, but obviously this month I haven't got COVID. Well, I, that, that helps with the mobility, I'm told. Definitely. So it's good. So far, so good. Fabulous. I've actually traveled more this January than I did, I think, almost all of 2022. So yeah, that, that, it's, it's going around. I also do not have COVID. Not quite. <laughs> I'm recording this from my home studio in Victoria, where, look, look, I can mo- move my arms out, yeah. and I'm not in a closet. I'm not trapped. <laughs> and when I get up from my desk, it doesn't terrify you because I'm pushing the camera away doesn't make it look like you're falling down a well. Yes. It's a relief. It's, uh, it's a whole new world. It's the one thing I like about being in Victoria. Uh, yeah, well, okay. My wife and also my office in that order, to be clear. <laughs> the other thing that Victoria does have going for it, I will say, is that it is not snowing here because living on the West Coast for, for 15 years, Paul, it made me soft. The <laughs> winters in Montreal, holy shit. It, uh, I, I was telling you earlier, I, I was teasing my friends because my friends live in a they rent a room in a house where I'm in an, a, a more modern apartment building for the time being. Their place is pretty cold. I said, oh man, my building, it's, it's so warm sometimes. I just wear an undershirt. Yeah, that didn't last when the temperature went down. Turns out the glass is real thin. Mm. So, you know, once the temperature dropped below a certain point, I was served karmic justice very quickly. <laughs> yes, we're, we're having our, our first cold, cold snap of the year. Oh, so you, you, you can't, you can no longer sunbathe on the lawn. Not this week, no. <laughs> Since the weather has finally come for both of us, we thought we would do an episode about somewhere warm. And where is warmer, I'm sure there are places, I just couldn't be bothered to look them up. Where is warmer than Miami, Florida? Death Valley. Okay, yeah, Death. I, 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 there must be stories from Death Valley. <laughs> Only about those creepy stones. Creepy stones? Stones, the way Death Valley is, there's the mystery of the stones and nobody understood how it worked. The stones seemed to move across the floor of the valley. Oh, was that Death Valley where that was happening? Mm-hmm. And it's the wind, isn't it? Yeah, okay. I was going to say, I, I, I remember hearing the, the story about the wind. I didn't realize that was Death Valley. Mm. Oh, man. Have you, have you ever been through Death Valley? No, I've never been to Cali yet. Oh, okay. Well, it, it earns its name. I was there at 10 o'clock at night and... It was, we opened up the car door briefly and it was like a blast furnace. <laughs> I, a friend of mine used to collect rocks. And so I, I grabbed a rock 
and just reached, you know, reached down from the car, grabbed a rock and it burned my goddamn hand, <laughs> which is, it's probably again, karmic justice because you shouldn't take rocks from places, folks. Just don't do it. I once ran into a guy, he was walking from one of the cruise ships here and we got talking and he said he was a gold miner in the Panamint Valley, which is in Death Valley. And I thought, how hard son of a bitch do you have to be to not just live in Death Valley and work there, but to be a gold miner there? I worked with gold miners very, very briefly when I was younger. It's awful, grueling, shitty work. And to do that in what, 45 degree temperatures? No, thank you, sir. Yes, I miss I miss the days of playing on the local slag heap. <laughs> What color will the river be today? <laughs> English kids, you guys had the best games in the 70s. <laughs> How noxious will this fog be? Why is the air yellow? Makes it tough. Kids have it too easy nowadays. <laughs> Getting bronchitis made men out of all of us. That's it. We've lost something yeah. as a collective people. They give you cigarettes to make you better. <laughs> Nine out of ten doctors say <laughs> smoking soothes the nerves. I will listen to you, sir, because you are smoking. I will not listen to you, sir, because you are not. Everyone knows. That, no, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it because someone's <laughs> going to give me shit. Don't smoke, kids. Yeah. But anyways, this episode is not about smoking or uh, Death Valley, although that could be a good episode. We've got to file that one away for later. Mm. This is about the ghosts of Miami, and I am very much looking forward to it. But before we do that, of course, we have to thank our patrons. This one's for the patrons. Patrons, you're the crocket to our tubs, <laughs> and together we will chase the cocaine boat of great stories. <laughs> And while we'd like to thank all our patrons, we would especially like to thank our latest patrons. They are... Pam R. Brendy. Mary Havana Little. Guys, thank you so, so much. I cannot tell you how much we appreciate our patrons. Everyone who listens to Ghost Story Guys, you help make the show what it is. But patrons, without you, the show just wouldn't go. And for that, we are forever in your debt. So thank you from the bottom of our terrible hearts. And if you want to join the team, head to patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. That's patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. We'll tell you at the end of the show what all the cool shit you get, but we will say for a dollar a month, you get an ad-free feed. And even though our ads are fucking hilarious, when you're a patron, you can choose to listen to them. Now, you don't have to listen to them. And you can get that at patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. Shout out to our composer, Rainy Days for Ghosts. Rainy Days for Ghosts is a project of film journalist and composer Jerry Smith. You can listen to Jerry's stuff everywhere. You stream your music, and if you'd like to hire them for your next project, shoot them an email at rainydaysforghosts at gmail.com. Also, want to give a shout out to our composer, Pizzanta Music. Peter Kursov, of course, had composed our theme song and the theme song for quite a few things that, that I've done. And Peter has a track on a new compilation out. So you'll find a link to that in the show notes. And that is, uh, of course, Peter is a hip hop producer and it's a great track. All of Peter's stuff is brilliant. And again, you'll find a link to that in the show notes. All right, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. So as we said before the break, this episode, we're going to be telling stories about the ghosts of Miami. And what was really interesting about this one, Paul, is I have no idea where the idea came from. The, the, the cold weather thing was literally just an excuse that I came <laughs> up with afterwards. Um, I don't know where the hell it popped into my head, but what I realized when I started looking is there's, there's not a lot about haunting in Miami. Usually when we do these regional episodes, you can find a book, you know, like uh, ghosts of like Chicago. There was a thousand ghosts about or books about ghosts in Chicago. Some of them actually decent, mm -hmm. but for Miami, there was there was one book. And guess how many pages that book was? Forty six. Half that. Twenty three. Oh. <laughs> twenty three pages. So it's a pamphlet. It's like someone just took a Gawker article and slapped a cover on it, basically. 
But um, anyways, so yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure what to expect because I'd never thought of ghosts in Miami in my head. I'd never, again, not a subject I'd ever really entertained. And as, yeah, as it turns out, there's not a ton out there, but some of the stuff that, that I did find was kind of bizarre, which I think has been a trend lately. You know, there's been some really oddball stuff we've had so far. Mm -hmm. this, I mean, it's only one episode this year, but this is definitely continuing that trend. Uh, before we get there, of course, we got to check the mail. Our courteous and efficient staff is on call 24 hours a day to serve all your supernatural elimination needs. We're ready to believe you. All right. So our first message is from Brooks. Hi guys. So last night I was driving home from a friend's house who lives about 30 minutes away from me. It was two in the morning when I left her house and started heading west towards my place. I was talking to my girlfriend as I drove home and I cut her off when she was talking and said, what the fuck is that? It was this massive bright light, which I first thought was one of the only skyscrapers in my town. But then I realized it was just above the mountains and way to the far east where really nothing is, especially that size and brightness. My girlfriend thought it was some military testing because there were military bases 45 minutes north of me and one and a half hours south of me. But it was strange, box-like, bright and huge. I know this isn't a paranormal and ghost story, but I thought Paul would like it. Mmm, interesting. I like the description of it being box-like. Have you heard that before? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's been a few cube-shaped things seen over over the past. I know there's a big flap going on at the minute. There's been some uh, FAA recordings released from someone, uh, an airline pilot, having a very hairy experience recently. Oh, really? Whereabouts? Uh, I think that was down south somewhere. I can't remember where Brooks lives. I probably shouldn't dox them anyways, but... Uh... <laughs> Nevada. Pilot reported seeing some strange lights about 200 miles to one side and asked if any military exercises were going on and they checked and nothing was happening. And they just kept... And he said, this is one of the best things. He said they kept swirling around each other. Oh. And then they went and then he just goes, they're back. <laughs> <laughs> For quite a while, so it's it's quite interesting. the uh, The full audio is on the Black Vault. I'll try and put a link to that in the show notes, folks. If not the actual recording itself, at least a link to the Black Vault. So, thank you, Brooks. That is that is really interesting. And again, I can't remember where you live, but uh, if you're in Nevada, maybe this will help give you some context. There are other people who are seeing these things. Mm -hmm. And if you can remember everything that happened, you're fine. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there are gaps. You should be worried. Yeah, that's fair. Our next message is from Charlie. Good evening, guys. Well, in North Florida it is. I'm relatively new to podcasts because I'm an old fucking man that I am. So when I finally dove in, I went in and subscribed to every horror and true crime show I could find. In the past month or so, I started listening to your show. And let me tell you, I am absolutely all in. I listen to all your most recent stuff. And whilst waiting for the new ones, I peruse the older shows. You two have great chemistry and absolutely infectious laughs. Brun, your laugh sounds like it came right out of a Hammer Studios soundtrack. <laughs> That's a Just nice like sounds. that. The and Paul, when you fucking laugh, it busts me up. <laughs> so when you guys are in discussion mode, I'm always waiting for one of you to crack the other one up. Such as making Paul say, I know why you've put this fucking in now. Make Paul say mal <laughs> <laughs> malevolent. Ha! Oh, nice. Get that I've been practicing. It absolutely makes it. my day. See, I've been learning that word and also doing Spanish every day. But anyway, it absolutely makes my day and makes the commute to and from work completely enjoyable. I also really like the messages you guys put out to your listeners about mental health and coping with life and stuff and the crazy motherfuckers in the world. I've been around a long time and seen a lot of shit and your encouragement to your listeners is inspiring. I have attached a story you might like to share in a future show. Check it out and please use it if you'd like. I'm working through some financial stuff right now, but I'm going to become a patron as soon as I'm able. You're the only one so far that has made me want to. You guys are so freaking awesome. Oh, shit, Charlie. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Very. I will say we're definitely going to use the story. And actually, that, that's a good opportunity to bring this up. I've had people reach out and say, you know, I've sent you stories. I haven't heard it in the show yet. And... Really, that's just because we get a lot of stories, which is not to say, you know, don't send your stories in because I, I read everything that comes in and I love reading your stories and we'll always try and include them as much as we can. But quite often what happens is if you send a story that's even tangentially related to a topic that we've been talking about doing a show on, I will put it aside for when I haven't for that episode. So for example, 
we had someone get in touch recently and say, hey, you know, I, I sent you some stories about Gettysburg, um, but I haven't heard them on the show. And, and the reason is we've been saving stories for a Gettysburg episode for about two years, two and a half years, and we're finally doing it in these coming months. So there'll be, you know, and so that, that happens. Like I've got first responder stories stacked up. I've, there are stories from like healthcare. There are stories about Pennsylvania. So if you do send us a story and you don't hear it on the show, it doesn't mean we don't like it. It doesn't mean that uh, there's anything wrong with it. It just means that we get a, you know, a fair number of stories and not every episode we do is a listener stories episode. So we, we can only kind of use them maybe once a month, you know, is, is kind of what we dip into listener stories. So yeah. So if you do send something in and you don't hear, hear it on the show right away, doesn't mean it's bad. Just means we, we haven't got to it yet, but keep them coming. Ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. We love, love reading your experiences. Next up is Andrea. Andrea says, I've always loved your podcast since I found it. And after some reflection, I realized I have a few stories. I'd like to tell you about one of them. It's very short, but it's been on my mind. When I was 12, my parents were divorced and I didn't get to see my dad every day. Still, he'd call me pretty often. One day on a call, he told me about a conversation he'd had with my grandmother. She told him she'd been folding her clothes on her bed when she'd looked up and seen a man sitting on the other side, folding a pair of her jeans. She wasn't alarmed by this for some reason. And the man seemed friendly, but didn't speak. She didn't either. She didn't know what to say. He was there long enough that eventually she had to verbally excuse herself to the bathroom. When she returned, he was gone. She herself wasn't sure if it had been a hallucination, angel, or what. She was very religious, but also realistic. A few months after Dad told me this, she died in her sleep. I like to think that the man was an angel. Maybe he was a sign they were preparing for her in heaven, that they were going to take care of her. I called my dad the other day to check the details and he confirmed them. He's fond of the story and wishes he'd asked more about it when she told him. And that's really cool, Andrea. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm. I just like the fact that someone sees a ghost doing domestic chores, which is quite unusual. Well, it does sort of suggest that they could be doing more of those things. Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, obviously the joke does the rounds a lot on social media is that, you know, if you do the seance and somebody says they're there, well... Then you tell them how much rent they owe and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was thinking, you know, the Bothell Hell House it should have been shouting at those things. Do the dishes, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you can chuck things around. You can wash. <laughs> well, maybe that's what they're doing when they leave pools of water places. They just didn't get round to it or they get disturbed and leave before they finish scrubbing the floor or something. They're like me. They've got ADHD. They get easily distracted when they're doing household tasks. Mm, mm. That that fits because yesterday, Nick was, she was at work and I was, you know, vacuuming and cleaning stuff up and taking out the garbage and shit. And I finished vacuuming and I was just about to put the vacuum away and I thought, oh, I should, I'm kind of hungry. So I went and had something to eat. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to watch a movie while I eat. So I went and sat down and watched the end of this Italian police drama I've been watching from for a while. <laughs> and uh, then I fell asleep on the couch, had a little nap. And then I woke up, it was uh, just, she was coming home and I still had the vacuum out. <laughs> just in the middle of the floor, you know. <laughs> I guess maybe I have more in common with poltergeists than I thought. <laughs> this next one is from Terry. Hello and happy new year. Happy new year, Terry. I wish you both great success in 2023. I look forward to every episode with your creativity, compassion, and humor. I was listening to a recent story you told about a truck driver that stayed overnight at a truck stop that didn't actually exist and thought I would share a story about something that happened to me on a Christmas Eve long ago. It's not the same thing, but it does have similarities. Thank you again for your fabulous podcast. So the story is entitled The Phantom Pizza Delivery Guy. It was Christmas Eve sometime in the early 80s and a big snowstorm had been forecast for that night. At the time, I was living in a new apartment complex west of Milwaukee. It was outside of the city limits, so I had to use a few country roads to get back and forth to my job in the city. I was looking forward to my family coming over later that night to celebrate and check out my new pad. It was about dusk and snowing lightly as I headed home from work. As I got closer to my house, the storm started to intensify and the snow started coming down hard. It was difficult to see the road ahead once I got onto the country roads near my house. There were no streetlights 
and nothing but woods on either side of me. However, I had faith in my trusty old Honda Civic, and it would get me home safely, I thought. All of a sudden, my car started slowing down for no apparent reason. I was able to pull over to the side of the road, but the engine went completely dead and wouldn't start again. Shit! I had people coming over and there were no houses or businesses on this lonely road. This was long before winter tech gear or cell phones. I was wearing my useless but fashionable black coat and non-white <laughs> and non-winter type boots. There was no way I could hike the couple of miles to my apartment. At this point, I started crying, feeling I was doomed. Within about five minutes, I saw car headlights approaching on the road behind me. The car slowed down and pulled up next to me. It was a local pizza delivery car with a glowing Ned's Pizza sign on the roof. The driver was an older man wearing a 50 style brimmed hat and black overcoat. He rolled down his window and asked if I needed any help. I like to think of myself as being streetwise, so normally I would have ignored him and locked the car doors, but for some reason I felt strangely comforted and accepted his offer of a ride. I looked inside his car and on the front seat was a pizza warming container, so I felt that he was legit. He moved it aside and said, come on in. I got in and told him where I needed to go. I asked him why he was delivering pizza this late on Christmas Eve in the middle of a blizzard, and he just smiled and didn't say anything. It was a quiet ride to my apartment, but we rolled up without incident. I thanked him profusely, tried to give him a tip, which he refused, and wished him a Merry Christmas as he drove off. I would need to call a tow truck to get my car after the holiday, but I was so relieved to be home. The day after Christmas, I called Ned's Pizza to tell the manager how grateful I was that their driver had stopped and helped me that night. The manager was surprised since the restaurant was not open on Christmas Eve, and no one matching the man's description worked there, or ever had. Someone drove me home that night, and I don't think it was someone impersonating a pizza delivery driver. I'm forever thankful. That's a fabulous story. How strange. I love it. I love it. I, it's funny. I was just talking this morning. I went for breakfast at the diner in my neighborhood and I was talking with the gal at counter about living in a place where just not having the appropriate, like basically exposing any skin to the cold will end you before you can really do much of anything. And, <laughs> and it kind of humbles you in the face of nature. You know, you start thinking, oh, well, I'm, I'm a pretty, I've got my shit together. I'm a pretty tough human being. And then the wind just goes, nope, no, you're absolutely not. <laughs> and what a, what a, just a terrifying experience that can be. So I, I can't imagine how frightened you must've been, Terry. Mm. It's kind of like the opposite of the phantom hitchhiker story, isn't it? I suppose it is. Yeah. Do the ghost go somewhere and tell people about this person they picked up? <laughs> <laughs> well, just imagine if the car disappeared around you while you were driving, you just start <laughs> rolling. Mm. You son of a bitch. You just hear this ghostly <laughs> chuckling as he drives away. Yeah. That's that's a great one. Thank you again, Terry. All right, so there's a quick one from Cresta Lee. Cresta Lee says, absolutely love the after shows you've been posting with additional conversations from you two. Please keep sharing those. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Cresta Lee. And yeah, if you're not part of the Patreon, what Cresta Lee is talking about is, uh, in addition to, you get shows like Book of the Dead, which is you know three ghost stories, no chatter, just just ghost stories, and then Host Adventures, which is me just kind of yakking about, about uh, what's going on with me. You get these little um, bonus conversations because Paul and I record the show for about four hours every two weeks. And generally speaking, only about two to two and a half of that is actual show material. The rest of it is just <laughs> us catching up on what's been up, what we've been doing the last couple of weeks or what movies we've seen or things that have annoyed us. And <laughs> I'll trim that down and trim out, you know, the objectionable bits. And that gets, <laughs> that gets, goes to the Patreon. So yeah, you usually get anywhere from 20 to sometimes as much as 45 additional minutes of. Yeah, me and Paul yakking and, and talking about these things. So um, I'm happy to know you enjoy that, Cresta Lee. If you want to hear all that stuff, patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Next up, we have a message from Natalia, who sent stories from Puerto Rico back in 2020. I was pushed against my bed by an invisible force when I was living in Miami. 
I felt ten fingers, like both hands and every individual finger against my ribcage. I freaked the fuck out, and it turns out the place I was living in was, to put it in urban terms, a crack house and was bought, remodelled and used in an apartment housing. The other housemates had far worse things done to them, but they were sorry on behalf of whatever the hell that was borderline bothering everyone. I lasted three months and flew back to my island. And Natalia, as this, as Paul mentioned, you know this this came in twenty twenty. This was part of um, something that I set aside for an episode on Puerto Rico, which will happen at some point. <laughs> and uh, it was just coincidence that it also happened to include something about Miami. So thank you for sharing that, Natalia. I I cannot imagine. I mean, uh, yeah, living in the living in the crack house thing. We used to have a crack house at the end of my block. And yeah, this is not an inspiring place. To, never mind living there. Just being around it was was not great. I can't imagine what the fuck it's like living in one. Actually, that's not entirely true because one of the guys I used to work with at the government way, way back, <laughs> he lived in that crack house. And so I would hang out at his place and have beers. So I, I at least knew what it was like to hang out in a crack house, which I don't recommend. <laughs> that guy actually turned out to be a crazy conspiracy theorist. How about the fumes? Oh, that explains it. Well, he's writing policy for the provincial government, so I'm sure nothing can go wrong. That actually might explain a few things about BC now that I think about it. <laughs> All right. So I thank you again, Natalia. We we ended up, uh, I don't know how much of that I'm going to leave in the show, but Paul and I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> thank you to everyone who sent us email. Again, we love hearing from you guys. Ghoststoryguys at gmail.com is a place to send it. And we will do our damnedest to get your stories into the show, to get your email into the show. And even if it doesn't get in there, please know we are reading it and we love, love, love hearing from you guys. And now it's time for the stories. Eyes. I couldn't tell you exactly how old I was when I had my first supernatural experience, but I'm guessing I was somewhere between seven and nine. At the time, I was living with my grandparents in Miami, where I shared a room with my younger brother on the first floor of their two-story duplex. It happened at night, when everyone else was fast asleep. I was in bed, laying on my left side and facing the door to the room. About three feet to the right of that was another door, this one in my closet, which was, of course, closed. Most nights, if I wanted to sleep, I'd have to stare at that closet door. Why? I couldn't say, but that's what I did. And on this particular night, after having stared at the closet door for a while, I suddenly saw an almond-shaped light appear. I was staring at this light, wondering what the heck it was, when suddenly it started traveling along the wall to the right. Traveling in a clockwise direction, the light crossed every wall in my room until arriving back where it started. Suddenly, a second almond-shaped light appeared next to it, and that light did the same thing, traveling across every wall in the room until it stopped right back where it had originally appeared, all while the first light stayed in place. It wasn't until then, after the second light finished its circuit, that I realized the two together were shaped like eyes. It looked like two glowing eyes were looking at me. I was overcome with fear, and I had no idea what to do. Too afraid to scream or get up, I finally settled on pulling the blanket up over my head. After a few moments, I peeked out and saw that the lights were gone, at which point I got up and turned on the overhead lamp. For hours, I tried to puzzle out exactly what it was I'd seen, but even now, after almost 30 years of continued paranormal experiences, I have yet to even guess at what it could have been. And I, I do kind of love the idea that you've got this kind of goggle-eyed ghost who just is very, very dizzy and has <laughs> to slowly kind of like drag himself into the world piece by piece. And so he just, by the time he kind of gets ready to haunt anyone, they've already just fucked off and gone to bed. <laughs> oh, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. <laughs> but it shows the power of, of blankets as well. I do love that. I, you know... I think we should make more things out of blankets, planes, you know, plane crashes, it's wrapped in blankets. Fine. <laughs> Maybe that's what the black box is made out of. It's just a big duvet. <laughs> well, 
Well, it's a shame Art Bell's no longer with us. He'd have liked that story because he was terrified of closets. Was he? Yeah, he he wouldn't sleep in a room with a without the closet door being closed. No kidding. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, that's just wise. I think gives you it gives you a head start on the demons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They've got to get through the door first, haven't they? That's it. Yeah, and I love the idea that you know it's kind of dark, so they might walk into the door first. In the closet, you hear this. Fuck my nose, my nose. Oh, <laughs> I'll get makes you. you. <laughs> That's right. I'll spoil your soul. <laughs> hey, what is their demon OSHA? They've got to fill out a form. <laughs> Walk into closet. I'm door. really going to possess you in a minute. <laughs> That's right. He's got one of those bandages that Nelly used to permanently have. <laughs> That's what happened, Nelly. Jesus, this is folks. I did, that that joke is twenty years old. Never mind. Yeah, one for the kids there. Yeah, holy Christ! I thought it was being real topical. Then I remember Hot and Hair came out twenty years ago. <laughs> ask your grandkids. Uh, ask your grandparents. Rather, <laughs> grandparents. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we never know. He might have got cool again. These things are quite cyclical, aren't they? Now nah, we're if we're doing nineties nostalgia right now. Everyone's everyone's all horny for the nineties. It's gonna the aughts are coming, and that's that's when I'm just finally gonna take my spaceship back home. But uh yeah, currently nineties nostalgia is what what has got everyone all hard and uh I don't like it. I walk past when I used to when I was living in Victoria full time, you know, there's this club that does a nineties night mm. and you just you walk past and there's all these literally young enough to be my kids, and they're all dressed like Kurt Cobain. But it's a costume, <laughs> and I'm very sad. And again, I was not into that. I was not, you know, I, I I was too young for grunge and I didn't like it anyways. But when they're all dressed like fucking bad religion and good Charlotte and shit, I'm going to be real, real depressed. <laughs> yeah. And it also shows the the transatlantic difference because they wouldn't be dressed like that for a 90s night here. What is What does 90s night in England look like? Are they all just dressed like minors? No. <laughs> what were the 90s in England? I have no, it occurred to me. I have no idea. They'd all dress like Oasis. Oh, that was the 90s. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, 94. Wow. Okay. That's actually better. Yeah. yeah same I, year I, Same year. Kurt Cobain died, Oasis appeared. Coincidence. <laughs> they sprung from his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no I, don't, I don't think. They were, they were going before that. No, nah, I'm sticking with my story, Paul. <laughs> so I'm a hipster. I saw, I saw them before they released a record. Where'd you see him? I uh, saw him in Manchester oh, twice. Sweet. Just to like small mate. shows. Yeah, I had a mate who was obsessed. He said these these guys are going to be massive, and he was right. <laughs> very cool. Yeah. So yeah, it was very indie. The 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 British sort of nineties. Everybody was wearing sort of sportswear and parkers <laughs> in <laughs> all weathers. I much rather go to the good I much rather go to the British nineties night than uh, yeah. Than yeah. grunge. I just, I never got into that. That whole Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and all that stuff. I just, I mean, I don't think Soundgarden's grunge exactly, but yeah, just mm. never, it was never my thing. Mm. I was very eclectic. I had, I had uh, all of that stuff. Really? Yeah. I really liked Soundgarden. Chris Cornell had a voice like an angel. Oh, Chris, Car- Chris Cornell had a brilliant voice. His, the two, the first two Audio Slave albums are mm. master. Well, the second one's a masterpiece. The first one's good. But the mm. second one's a legit masterpiece, Out of Exile. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, his voice. <clears throat> yeah, all of that. Yeah. Stone Temple Pilots, Alice in Chains, uh, Halcyon Days. A younger, brighter time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've always had very eclectic tastes. That's a good I think it's a good thing. I think it's good to to you know, listen to a lot of different musical influences. Honestly, I think now that's actually the norm. I think streaming has made it so easy to sample so many different kinds of music mm. that I think more people now have eclectic tastes than than ever before. Because you know, it used to be, you know, oh, you want to try a different kind of music? Pay twenty five dollars for the album. <laughs> I mean, admittedly, this is a time when people had twenty five dollars to spend, but still, you know, it was it was hard to listen to the like a breadth of music, whereas. The other day I was, I was thinking, man, I haven't listened to power metal in a hundred years. And I, when I designed the cover for the last episode, I, I wanted to make it look like an eighties heavy metal album. So I, I came up with dragons and fire and all that shit. And so that got me thinking, I, what's new power metal? 
what's, you know, I haven't listened to anything really since like Primal Fear in the early 2000s. And I looked it up and I was just able to stream the albums, you know, the best new power metal albums of 2022. And there's some great shit in there. And I was just able to fire it up on Spotify. And yeah, I think it's, it's made all of us, I'd like to think at least it's made us uh, better music fans. Although there are still, you know, people listening to, oh, I'm not, I better not, I'm not. If I say anything, I'm just going to make me sound like a grumpy old man. Post Malone. <laughs> hey, Brian. Since when did we have chickens? Oh, hey, Paul. Well, you know how I'm back at the gym. Sure. Well, that means I need to get my protein intake back up, and not to cost a chicken nowadays, I just thought... You'd raise your own. Right. I see the logic there. But why don't you just try Huel Black Edition? What's Huel Black Edition? Huel Black Edition is a nutritionally complete, high-protein vegan meal in a convenient shake. A whole meal in one shake? That's right. Each scoop of Huel contains 200 calories. I use two scoops per shake. That gives me 27 essential vitamins and minerals, plus 40 gram of lactose and gluten-free, naturally flavoured protein. It's convenient, delicious, and at an average of $2.50 per 400 calories, inexpensive way to meet your nutritional needs. Huel sent us samples of their cookies and cream flavour, and I love it. You sold me, my friend. How do I get some Huel? Go to huel.com slash gsg to place your order. That's H-U-E-L dot com slash G-S-G. And first time customers get a free t-shirt and shaker. Huel dot com slash G-S-G. All right, I'm in. So now what are you going to do with these chickens? Chase them for cardio, I guess. If it's good enough for Rocky, it's good enough for me. You know, Rocky wasn't real, right? Let me, let me have this, Paul. Your light. I had my first experience two months ago and I can't believe how much my life has already changed. It's strange to even talk about it, but I can't quite explain it away. Back in 2013, during my deployment to Afghanistan, I had a sort of experience that my brain more or less found a way to write off. But now I'm questioning what really happened that cold January night overseas. This story isn't about Afghanistan, though. This story is about Miami. It would be more accurate to say this story starts in Miami. It was a Sunday night and I was planning to visit my friend Marta in Naples, two hours away to the west. Marta needed the company as she was going through a bad breakup and I was coming up to a run of days off with plenty of time to kill. Going to Naples, the GPS usually sends me via the I-75, but that night it sent me further south onto the Tiamani Trail which is a two-lane road starting in Brickell before heading into Little Havana and then cutting through the Everglades all the way west. I'd never taken that road before, and starting the drive at 10pm, I was unprepared for how dark and desolate it was. If you drive through it in the middle of the night, expect to drive for miles and miles with nothing but the night to keep you company. It was maybe 45 minutes into my drive when the creep factor reached a new high point. Driving into the middle of nowhere and not seeing other cars or people around was bad enough. But at one point, I suddenly felt the sensation that something was very, very wrong. It felt like the beginning of a panic attack. Your body goes into fight or flight mode and your stomach starts twisting. Your hands start sweating. It was then I saw a dark thing on the side of the road by some tall grass. I wasn't able to pick out a specific shape, but it seemed like it was hunched over. At first I thought it was a huge alligator, but given what I could see of its outline, that didn't make sense. I threw on the high beams, but they didn't help at all, so instead I decided to drive slowly past it in order to see what it was. The thing was within 50 metres of me when it appeared to lay down, disappearing into the grass. Again, I want to remind everybody about the intense feeling of fear, which was still in full effect. Upon reaching the spot where I had seen the shape, there was nothing. I didn't have a flashlight, but tried using my cell phone light, with no success. 
my sense of rationality had just about managed to pack the whole experience away when the fear inexplicably became terror. I gripped my steering wheel so hard I thought it might actually break. That's when I heard a low growl right behind me. I was frozen in panic. It happened again, this time deeper and louder, right by my ear. A raspy, deep voice said, Look in the mirror. And I did. What I saw there was a black mass with red eyes staring back at me. Yes, you heard that right. I think it was then that my military training kicked in, because I was able to croak out, What do you want? I realised that at some point I had started shaking, and the thing replied slowly, Your light. I didn't even know what that meant. Just then I was momentarily distracted by a noise to my left, which had no apparent origin, and by the time I'd turned back, the mass in my back seat was gone. You can bet your ass I put the pedal to the metal and got out of there, and I've seen combat and was still never so scared as that night. Since then, I've had a few strange dreams about whatever that thing was, but nothing worth writing down. It bothers me though, and I can't help but wonder what the hell it meant by wanting my light. Yeah, I don't like that. That is that is borderline comic book supervillain talk. <laughs> no, you want my light. That seems intimate. You can't have it. Unless you pay. I mean, we can talk about that. <laughs> Dormammu, I've come to bargain. <laughs> trying to think it reminds me of a film where they pull something out like that i mean it's something similar in dr sleep isn't there oh of course yeah 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 absolutely you know i liked that movie it didn't do very well but i mm. really enjoyed dr sleep i actually just bought the a digital copy of the director's cut and uh, for our listeners who don't know dr sleep is the uh the sequel to the shining uh written by stephen king the film is directed by mike flanagan and it's sort of deals with these characters who are kind of like energy vampires, but not the fun kind, like Colin Robinson on what we do in the shadows. <laughs> Kids who have the shining, that, that sort of that psychic power, they suck the energy out of them. It's almost as if whatever he saw was a distraction and that's how it appeared. It's almost as if it needed him to be not paying attention so it could sneak into the car. Sorry, do you think the thing in the back was a distraction? No, the thing in the on the road was. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I've I've often wondered about some of these these cases of missing people. You know, there's the ones where people are, they end up, uh, like there's a couple of cases I've read about where people, they were about, something was about to happen and they realized it happened because they were distracted. Mm. You know, like they, they got a phone call. One, well, there's one guy in particular, he got a phone call and he left, he left the restaurant. The restaurant is in the country. Mm. And for some reason, he just started walking while mm. on the phone. And by the time he finished the call, he realized he didn't know where the fuck he was. And he said, I don't know why I was walking. It never occurred to me to go for a walk, but it was almost like the distra being distracted, he was led somewhere. Mm. And I do sometimes wonder if there is an element of distraction, like if your conscious mind has to be pulled somewhere else to kind of allow this, this entry. Yeah, I think so. It's just almost as if it... It uses it to, so you let your guard down. Yeah. Have you ever heard any stories from the Everglades of cryptids or things like this? Skunk ape. That's in the Everglades. Skunk ape. It's one of the, the best, well, one of the most reported cryptids in, in North America is the Florida skunk ape. I had no idea. Yeah. And you, it's not hard to work out why it's called the skunk ape. It uh, keeps chasing around a cat that's got no, a- it's <laughs> Right down her back? Yeah, yeah, it's French. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> my my <Shelly>. <laughs> It's a sex pest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Modern, uh, the modern <laughs> lens does not do Pepe Le Pew any favors. Anyways, continue. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the skunk ape is essentially Florida's version of, of the Bigfoot family tree. Oh, okay. So on top of all, all the other crazy creatures living in the Everglades. They've got that. Andrew, so does skunk ape, when, when it's sort of encountered, is does it do the thing like Bigfoot where it throws, throws rocks and shit? Uh, they're more aggressive. 
They're very territorial. They shout a lot. They chase people. They throw things at them. We had a story a long time ago from a listener who worked as a prison guard in Florida. Mm. And part of their, their job involved driving the perimeter all night. That mm. was, that was the, when they were on perimeter duty, they would just drive this van all around the perimeter of the prison and just, you know, look out for shit. Mm. And one night they got out and I can't remember why they got up. Maybe it was to have a smoke or something, but something started throwing rocks at them from the boat, from the trees. Mm. And when they came around the one side of the van, as I recall, there was a handprint. Yep. Yeah. On the on the on the on the wall, so that or on the window, so that kind of sounds similar to what you're talking about. It's aggressive. It's. And that's it. I'm just going to double check something. Yeah. So I'm just I just wanted to make sure I'm 100 percent convinced it was. But the the thing about the skunk cape is that um, one of the most controversial cryptid photos in modern history is of the skunk cape, and they were sent anonymously to the Sarasota Police Department, and essentially it looks like a strange kind of orangutan. Oh, okay. They are as clear as, as day. There's oh. no, it's not, it's not a blurry mess or it's fuzzy or anything. You can clearly see what that creature is. Fascinating. Were you able to, do you have a link? Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing with this is that the, the images that are often circulated are not the original image. They are copies of copies of the original image. So it's lost its definition. But if you see the original one, Right. Because people have said, oh, it's a cardboard cutout. Okay. Sure. Well, it, it isn't. Because it kind of looks like a cross between an orangutan and a baboon. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, it's known as the Mayaka skunk cape photo. Sleep well after looking at that. Sweet Jesus Christ. That's horrifying. Mm hmm. That was taken in 2000. You know, people always joke about the fact that there's no great photos of Bigfoot. And I got to say, you know what? If it looks anything like this fucking thing, I am glad that is the case. We are all better off for there not being more photos. Yeah. You know where that, the interesting thing about that though is? Uh, that photo was taken near the I-75. No shit. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was an old woman. Allegedly, it's an old woman and uh, something kept coming into her garden and fucking things up. <laughs> right. So she set a camera up and it took two pictures. Oh, so there are, man. There are two of them. I mean, I, I, I understand it's eye shine, but it's, it's, terrifying mm. folks we're, we'll put a link to this in the show notes and uh yeah sweet dreams yeah good lord yeah dave she's the the main man when it comes to the skunk cape dave she mm. has he been on eminem not yet i've been trying to get him on for ages he's very uh very reclusive oh okay but hopefully 2023 is the year of miracles brennan for who who may <laughs> or may not appear so we'll see. I'm hopeful. I'd love to have him on. Um, but there Absolutely. is a, a skunk ape museum and stuff in Florida. Where about? Um, I'm not too sure exactly. Hang on a sec. Ochopee. On the Tamiami Trail. I was going to say, yeah, Ochopee is just to the, to the west. Yeah. So, yeah, in that area. Okay. Jesus. Yeah. Skunkape.info. All right. Here's where well, to go and we'll get all your... Uh, <laughs> You can go touring there. You can go on a skunk cape tour if you wish. Why in God, after seeing that picture, I can't imagine why you'd want to. <laughs> you'd have to have a death wish. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you've got to be careful, especially orangutans, because orangutans are the most sexually aggressive member of the ape family, aren't they? I don't even know how to go past that. That's... <laughs> yeah. Sometimes there, there are some, inf some facts you don't want to know. Yeah, as I've learned today. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. So the the, the skunk, there's there's footage of it. Dave She got a famous video clip from about two. I think it was in the year two thousand of one walking across a field in broad daylight. It's clearly something, right? Good lord, that that is just nightmare fuel. And uh, just before we go, I found I found that uh, listener emails from a listener named Michael who sent this in back in January twenty twenty. And I, I know it, it did end up in the show. I just can't remember what the episode was. It might have been Haunted Prisons. Michael was a prison guard at the time in, in Florida. Uh, he didn't specify where, which is probably for the best. But Michael says, there was a perimeter vehicle that rode the perimeter road all night. Everyone told me before my first time out there not to hang out by the water tower. I assumed they were just messing with me. And after driving for four hours and 
and having eight to go, I decided to park for a bit. That night we had a van out there as the car was being repaired. It was a muggy Florida night and the van had condensation all over it from the AC running inside. I parked out by the water tower and got out to smoke a cigarette and heard the sound of something hitting the side of the van. I slowly walked over and looked and nothing was there, but there was a small area where the water on the van was disturbed. As I stood there trying to figure out if I was just tired, or if I really heard something, I heard a hit on the driver's side where I had just been, and a second after I heard the sound of skin sliding on the glass window. It lasted a few seconds, enough for me to be sure of what I was hearing. I held my shotgun close and walked around to the driver's side, and there was no one there. But there was a handprint on the driver's window, elongated all the way down, as if it had slid down the length of it. I stood there knowing I needed to get in the van and leave that spot, but I was in shock. Then I heard a scream in the woods, about 20, 30 yards from the road. As I stared into the darkness, I saw a set of red glowing eyes floating in midair staring back at me. That gave me the kick I needed to get my ass in the van and drive away. The rest of that night I avoided that spot on the road and didn't stop again. I never worked perimeter at that institution again, and about three months later I resigned and started my new career with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And I never looked back. And so that sounds consistent with what you're talking about. Yep. Well, there you go, folks. I never thought we would talk about the skunk ape on this show, and I'm, I'm glad we have. <laughs> Tell you, though, do not look at those photos before bedtime. Sweet zombie Jesus. <laughs> The condo. About 10 years ago, while living in a condo on the water near Biscayne Bay, my girlfriend and I were witnesses to two separate events I suppose you could call haunting. I won't say the name of the condo, but it was new at the time, and the area is built up, as you can imagine. My girlfriend, Isa, was living on the 45th floor, and when she called me late one night, all freaked out, I first thought she might have smoked too much weed. Still, I could tell she was scared and tried to calm her down by asking what was wrong. Isa told me that when she had turned the television off, she had seen people reflected in the screen. Not after images from the show, but an actual reflection of people there in the room with her. She could also feel something brushing up against her, as if a wind were passing. She was panicked enough I knew I couldn't leave her alone, so I headed over. Even as someone who doesn't believe in ghosts, I couldn't deny that the air in her place felt thick and heavy which was not normal. Nothing else occurred that night, or for the next few days, but after maybe a week, I woke up in the night and happened to glance in the mirror to my right. Someone was standing there, and it wasn't Isa. I stared back for about ten seconds before saying to myself, you know what, my eyes are playing tricks on me, I'm just going to go back to bed. It was the only thing I could think of to do other than have a full-blown meltdown. More time passed, and things kept happening. Isa and I thought it might be wise to get out of town for a weekend, and so we hit up a resort in Boca. It was a nice hotel, beautiful and historic, and that might have been part of the problem. The history, I mean. I say that because during lunch, Isa got up to use the bathroom, and when she came back, her face was pale. When I asked what was up, she said something had grabbed her ankle. Hard. We lifted up her dress to find a huge palm print. Things of this nature occurred, and eventually, after attempted healings and looking for any kind of help you could imagine without feeling like a crazy person, Isa and I parted ways. The other day, I wanted to see if anyone else might have experienced something similar in the area, and came across an article about an old building right next to the new condos. It's been said to have had demonic worship going on in it, and people have seen shadow figures walking on the roof. Not sure if it's a coincidence or if it's linked, but... In hindsight, it seems hard to ignore. And Paul, you'll see in the notes, i pretty sure I've identified uh, the building. Uh, I won't say on the show because the author didn't yeah. include it. Although bizarrely, he included the fucking intersection. And there's only a handful of condo blocks at that intersection, but whatever. Mm. Um, but yeah, and I think uh, it, it's right on Biscayne Bay. And I think the building he's talking about, if you look at the center of the image just behind, there's that tiny little building. Yeah. So I think it's around there. And and the thing I find fascinating about this is I, they're, they're really nice buildings. These are not, you know, spooky run down. I mean, the, the apartment building he's referring to is, but the building where it's happening is, is, yeah, it's very, very modern and bright and airy. 
And I think it's such a great reminder that this shit can happen no matter where you are. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to be quote unquote spooky. Things just are weird. You know, or pardon me, things can just be weird. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it reminds me of um, when I was delivering DoorDash or Skip the Dishes back in, back during the pandemic, uh, which was a trip. Kind of hard to believe I did that now. But anyways, I remember uh, on one of the shows we did in 2020, I talked about delivering to one of these new buildings. I think it was the Azuro building in Victoria and feeling like there was something wrong there. Mm. And then we had a listener write in and say that they either lived or knew someone who lived in that building and they confirmed that there was in fact something going on there. And it was a brand new ultra modern building. Yeah. But th- there was there was something going on. So yeah, again, I, it just goes back to what we always say that it's got more to do with the land than it does the building. I mean, it's quite strange because one of the other stories mentions the Hilton in Miami. Yes. Which is also in Biscayne Bay. No shit. Mm. Interesting. I wonder if there's a larger history of haunting in and around Biscayne Bay. I, I'd sort of just look generally for Miami. I, I look for a handful of um, neighborhoods, but I didn't actually think to look for specifically haunting in Biscayne Bay. There's nothing really that that's renowned for being haunted in Biscayne Bay. Right. Because the most haunted hotel in Miami is not in Biscayne Bay. That's the Biltmore, right? Mm. It is. And now, what have you heard about the Biltmore? <clears throat> well, haven't you heard about it? <laughs> <laughs> what else do you need? It's got gangster murders, uh, ghosts that redecorate rooms, people who apparently get in the lift and the lift takes them to whatever floor the lift wants to go. Footsteps, people complaining of parties on empty floors. It's a crazy I, building. It was abandoned for 10, 15 years, completely left. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, in the 80s, it was just left. And then oh, it got bought bought up. Um, oh, end of the eighties, early nineties, and was redeveloped and brought back to what it was. It's such a grand building; mm. it's hard to imagine it empty. Mm. And and I think that's like that's almost your prototypical abandoned haunted hotel, given the yeah. size of it. Yeah, we'll we'll include a link to the Biltmore Hotel so you can check it out, folks. But because it, it, it's a it's an like when you think of Miami hotels, or when I think of Miami hotels. That's the kind of place I think of. A, the kind of place I can never afford, but B, also just very, very, yeah, grand. 400 pounds a night. Oof, man. A while ago, I was out for a walk in Montreal and I walked past the Ritz Carlton <laughs> up on Sherbrooke. I looked at it and I thought, oh, wow, that looks very fancy. And uh, there was a bus parked out front and these dudes just waiting outside. And one of them was holding a bottle of whiskey and I thought, oh, what's going on here? So I, I hung around <laughs> and fi- I was just waiting. And finally I realized I need to ask what we're waiting for. Cause I, if, if it happens, I may not know. So I asked one of the guys, well, what are we waiting for? And the guy goes, oh, the New Jersey devils are staying here. And I thought, oh, well, who gives a shit? And I left. But, um, I, apparently the, I looked it up after those t- talking to Nick about it. And it, yeah, it's a thousand bucks a night hmm. for a room there. That's literally a month's rent for my apartment here for a single night in a room in a hotel. I, yeah. I cannot imagine having that much extra, extra money. Yeah. You could get a month in Spain for that. Yeah, that's exactly it. You in can get villa. things for that. <laughs> things. <laughs> nice things. <laughs> a PS5 is what I mean, folks. <laughs> Bathroom. This experience happened when I was an elementary school student in Miami, Florida. At the time, I was, I believe, in the fourth grade, which would make me around 10 years of age. Now, I have always been into the paranormal and do things like play Bloody Mary and tell scary stories with my friends, but this was my first actual experience. Many more would follow. On this particular day, I was upstairs in a classroom that was positioned next to the main staircase of the school. It was afternoon and I had to use the restroom, so I raised my hand and started towards the facilities. For context, the doors on the bathroom were big heavy metal doors that made loud noises when opening and closing. I've always been a bit of a germaphobe when it comes to public bathrooms, and who could blame me? So I'd always check every single stall to pick the cleanest one. The bathroom was empty, 
and most of the stalls were gross except the first one nearest the door. I had just started to do my business when, all of a sudden, I heard the toilet paper in the stall next to me start rolling. For more context, the toilet paper holder was metal, so when someone rolled paper out, it was incredibly loud. No one had come in, so this made no sense whatsoever, so I started rushing to finish my business. The roller was getting faster and louder. Finally, I finished and ran out of the stall, not caring if anyone had heard me. The moment I swung open my stall door, the toilet paper noise stopped, and as I was opening the big metal door to leave, I glanced back to see the stall empty and all its toilet paper in place, exactly as it should be. Following that experience, I never used the bathrooms in that school again. A lot of times I would get close to soiling myself, and my mother would try to convince me to use them when I needed to, but I would rather have embarrassed myself than to have had to experience something there again. And I mean, you know, that, that was, uh, let's say, not, not a dramatic account of, of an experience. But I, I do, it just made me think that we, we do kind of have these funny little rules around stuff in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, like like the, the this woman telling the story, you know, I, I I didn't care who heard me do my business quickly. And I just think we're all kind of like that, aren't we? Yeah. We all know what the fuck we're doing in the bathroom. But at the <laughs> same time, we all try to pretend like, no, we're just here to check the stocks. You know, I, I got a, you know, I was supposed to meet someone and I'm, you know, I, I got lost and, you know, well, while I'm here, you know, I was like, no, we're all here to make horrible noises and produce noxious smells. I remember one time I, I was, uh, I was, we were standing at the urinal and the guy, a couple, a couple of urinals down, he, he farted and another guy went, oh, come on. And literally everyone turned to look at him. Like, what is your problem? What do you think we're here to do, buddy? <laughs> If you got a problem with farting in the bathroom, friend, I don't know what I can do for you. <laughs> you used one of these before. Yeah, right? Are you new here? Yeah. You new in town, sailor? <laughs> That's a different kind of bathroom experience. Let's... <laughs> I love a haunted bathroom. One of the guys I've got to know, Steve Jones, he's obsessed with collecting stories of haunted bathrooms because there's tons, tons of pubs in, in England with haunted toilets and where I work. In Sheffield, there, there is a haunted toilet on the third floor. Now, you know, what makes it haunt? Is it does it just flush on its own, or or does it you know kind of like feed me, see more it talks, or? Uh, yeah, it tends to flush because nobody works on the third floor. It's meeting rooms, so it's usually right. empty. So the 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 stall door will open and close. It'll lock itself. It'll unlock itself. It'll flush, and taps will come on and off. Oh, that's wild! And it's censored as well. The lights are all censored in in the office. Right. So sometimes you can get the lift and it will stop on the third floor, but the lights aren't on. Oof. Or sometimes you can see the lights going on and there's nobody there. That would end me. Like it's coming closer and closer. Oh, Christ. Yeah. We've got a cleaner who will not work on the third floor at all. Really? Yeah, because she was scared by something that happened in that toilet. Do you know what happened or she was just scared? Yeah, just she, she, um, she was in there cleaning and the door lo unlocked itself. and oh, Well, it locked. And she was like, oh, I'm really sorry. And then it unlocked itself and the door swung open and there was nobody in the cubicle. Oh, Jesus And Christ. she was like, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> she, was like, she, was, she was like, Ben Johnson up the stairs. <laughs> yeah, time to take up a new line of work. <laughs> yeah. So she's refused ever to go. She'll go on the third floor, but not on her own. She'll go with somebody else and she won't clean the lady. And it's the ladies' toilet, not the men's. I'll be damned. I remember we, we did a whole episode once. It was 99. Yes, Virginia bathrooms can be haunted too. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was just, yeah, like an hour's worth of haunted shitter stories. And uh, as you say, I just, uh, there's something about a haunted bathroom. Yeah. I'm trying to remember there's a pub somewhere down south in Lon London, I think, that's got a very aggressive female ghost that accosts people in the toilets. She only attacks women. Oh, interesting. I'm trying to remember where that is. But yeah, there's really weird ones like that. Well, I know Holton that. House in Revelstoke, um, the spirit that's one of the spirits that's said to be there, uh, previous residents told me that it, it, it really doesn't like women mm. and it, it had staked out certain rooms in the house as its own. So it didn't like you fucking with them, but mm. also, yeah, if a woman went in there, it would be doubly pissed off. Ooh. They said it was like, it was like someone screaming at you with the volume turned down. If that makes oh, sense. God. So, yeah, yeah. 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 And since we're talking about, uh, 
well, you know, spooky shit. Um, and you know, <laughs> literally, literally, uh, <laughs> vaguely, vaguely, uh, poltergeist related things. Uh, I found this, this little, this little snippet and I saved it for you because I know how much you like poltergeists hmm. and it's, it's from Miami, but it, it was not enough to develop into a, a full story. It's from the book Haunted Places, The National Directory, Ghostly Abodes, Sacred Sites, UFO Landings, and Other Supernatural Locations by Dennis William Houck. Mm. And this is from the Tropication Arts Incorporated. And it says, this novelty warehouse was a scene of 224 documented manifestations of poltergeist activity. The trouble started on December 15th, 1966, when a number of amber glass steins were discovered broken. Then mugs, combs, plastic hand fans, and other merchandise started rolling off the shelves by themselves. Within a month, workers in the warehouse were starting to panic, and the owners of the firm, Alvin Laubheim and Glenn Lewis, decided to call the police. Patrolman William Killiam witnessed so many strange events in his first hour at the scene that he called for a team of police officers as backup. The American Society for Psychical Research was contacted, and investigators William Roll and J.G. Pratt began a comprehensive study of the site on January 21st, 1967. Their 10-day survey documented 150 events and concluded that they could not have been faked. They also discovered that most of the poltergeist activity centered around a 19-year-old Cuban worker by the name of Julio Vasquez. Julio was burdened with personal problems, which may have culminated in subconscious bursts of psychic energy. On January 30th, Julio broke into the warehouse and stole some petty cash. He was fired, but no charges were filed. That same day, the poltergeist activity ceased. A few days later, he was arrested for stealing an engagement ring, intended for his fiancée from a local jewelry store. He was sentenced to a short jail term, after which he was released, and ASPR researchers tested him and found that he showed a marked ability to produce psychokinetic effects. Julio married Maria Santos in June 1968, and the couple had a baby in February 1969. Then, in March 1969, while working at a service station in Miami, Julio was shot three times by a teenage robber. The bullets entered his intestines and severed his aorta, but the remarkable man survived, although he can no longer engage in any strenuous activity. The Psychical Research Foundation offered the destitute man a financial grant if he would attend the Durham Technical Institute in North Carolina, but Julio refused. He said he did not want to become a guinea pig for scientists. One of William Roll's cases that he's always said is one of the most compelling he's ever investigated. Really? Mm. Fabulous. So, so okay. So I, I thought it might I thought it might have a new one there, but you can't slip one by Paul Bessel, folks. <laughs> it's because it's really weird because it was a warehouse and there's the there are load, loads of witnesses. They were absolutely convinced there was no way he was faking it. Really? Well, even the police ah. saw it, and stuff would happen when he wasn't there. I'm just looking at the address, and it is it's empty now, but it's um it's also not that far from Piscane Bay. <laughs> just moving around uber <laughs> boober or would it be a goober oh, i like boober better but then goober's pretty good too <laughs> goober okay there we go that, that we got it <laughs> school trip when i was 15 my private school class went on a trip to the usa from brazil we visited new york orlando and miami at each stop, we grouped up three to a room, which meant I always stayed with my friends Lucas and Francisco. We only stayed one night in Miami at the Hilton, and it was a night I'll never forget. It was about 9 p.m., and since there were no activities planned for the evening, we thought we would just rent a movie on TV and then go to sleep. Lucas decided he wanted to shower beforehand, so we went into the bathroom. A moment later, Francisco and I heard the sound of glass breaking from behind the door. So we laughed, thinking Lucas had just fucked up and broken one of the hotel's glasses. Lucas then stormed out, asking why the hell we'd gone in and broken a glass while he was in the shower. We tried to convince him there was no way we could have gotten in and out without him seeing us, but he wasn't budging. Eventually, he gave up and went to finish cleaning himself off. A bit later that night, Francisco turned white as a sheet, a look of fear on his face. He claimed to have just seen a dark figure rapidly moving towards the bathroom but neither me nor Lucas believed it. He swore he'd seen something, but again, we moved on. About 30 minutes later, the phone rang, and I stood up to pick it up. It was then I saw it, 
a dark figure moving quickly toward that bathroom. It was my turn to go pale, and I dropped the phone on the floor. The three of us freaked out with no idea what to do, so we hunkered down in the same bed and stayed there. A few minutes later, we heard knocking on our door, so Lucas and Francisco got up to open it, while I stayed in bed praying. There was no one outside, and the motion-activated lights in the hall were dark. That was the end of the experience, and to this day we still talk about that night, not knowing what happened. Now, I gotta say, and this I think just speaks to my bias based on the relationships I've had in my life and the people I've known, but when I first read the story and saw that they stayed in, in Miami when they were on a trip, I assumed it was girls. Because all the teenage males I know, the second they have any lack of supervision and they're in a place like that and no plans for the night, they're going to be outside rolling shopping carts down the street and taping firecrackers to their balls. This just, <laughs> there's no way they stay inside. There's just no way. <laughs> I mean, my mother, we once found out that my mother met her sister's husband years before they ever met when she was traveling with the school's foot, uh, volleyball team or basketball team. My, my mom used to play basketball, which mm. is hilarious because my mom's <laughs> five feet tall, but she, she was a very good athlete. But <laughs> she was traveling with the basketball team and they thought, oh, well, you know, it's nighttime, so we're going to stay in our room. Whereas some boys from elsewhere actually climbed up into their room with beers. <laughs> and that's just sort of what I expect. I mean, I'm well open to, you know, the opposite happening because I'm sure it does. But yeah, as soon as I read, oh, we responsibly decided to stay in and watch a movie, I thought, well, there's, there's no way this is teenage boys. <laughs> you know, these guys are, they're absolutely going to go pay two homeless men to fight each other or stick stuff up their butts. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is they're going to do, it's going to be trouble. And uh, it's probably going to end in some kind of property crime. <laughs> But then there was a bit about them laughing at their friend when they thought he broke a glass. And I'm like, no, okay, that fits. That fits. <laughs> oh, Earl might have cut himself. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, times are changing. Even even men need some downtime. That's it. Yeah, sometimes we need nice cologne and moisturizer. I'm going to say they might have had a self-care night, a bit of... Cleanse, tone, and moisturize with a, with a good film. <laughs> we all got to look after ourselves. Like you said, Paul, none of us are getting any younger. Yeah. Quiet night in with Return of the Living Dead. I, I, I don't know how quiet it's going to be with Linnea Quigley on screen, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, speaking of which, I recently watched Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers for the first time, <laughs> which has her in it. Yeah. And it's a ton of fun. It's on Tubi for free, folks, if you, if you want to watch a sleazy 80s horror film. Uh, and, and believe me, if you go in expecting a film called Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, you will not be disappointed. But as you probably saw on the uh, In Search of Darkness documentary, in the, the final scene in the temple, she does the dance of the chainsaw maiden or whatever. <laughs> and it, it has her coming out of a sarcophagus holding two chainsaws. Well, the chainsaws were running and she was locked up in a sarcophagus. So when she comes out, she's stumbling. And it's because she was practically poisoned from the carbon <laughs> monoxide from the chainsaws. And she was, she was a small woman. So when you, when you watch that and you actually realize what was happening, you think, Jesus, she's lucky did, she didn't die. Yeah. Or kill somebody because it was a real chainsaw. Yeah, that two real chainsaws. <laughs> the 80s. Yay. Oh, it was, uh, yeah. I'm glad we're over 80s. Give time. that I'll woman that. Some, so, some cocaine. <laughs> That's right. She looks she's... tired. <laughs> and some chainsaws. <laughs> That'll sort her out. So that's a, a solution to everything. Walk it off, have some cocaine, get some chainsaws. <laughs> get some scrunchies. Oh, yeah. Well, that, you know, not really concerned for either of us, but. <laughs> wear it on my chest. <laughs> I was going to say wear it around our wrists so we look like super gentlemen when someone needs a hair tie. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you, folks, you want to impress the ladies. Have a little little elastic band around your wrist. She needs to hold it, to, you know, put her hair up. Oh, here you go. Suddenly, you're no longer sleeping on the couch. Now, you're actually allowed to sleep on the floor in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> on the rug that hasn't been hoovered for a year. Uh, it's, uh, it's better than the couch. I'm just mm. kidding. 
<laughs> no, I love my couch. I'm just fucking around. I never understood that. You've been bad. Go sleep in the dog. Like, really? What kind of relationships are you guys having? You got you got this is not good. Go sit in that room with a world of entertainment. <laughs> I know it's it's like sending a kid to his room and he's got a you know PS5 in there. Oh no, okay. If I must. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> that was such a, a trope, right? Before before divorce became more, you know, much more easily obtainable. Just <laughs> married couples hating the shit out of each other. We were on a cruise once, our honeymoon cruise. And I would never go on a cruise again. But <laughs> the host of the onboard entertainment hour show said he stopped bringing couples up on stage because he once had this elderly couple up there and, you know, they, he, they'd been married for 50 some years. And he said, what's your secret? And the old lady just said, he won't die. <laughs> I just think, man, divorce sure saved people a lot of trouble. The Beach House. This happened two summers ago at a beach house in Miami. It belongs to my brother who mostly rents it out when we're not using it for family get-togethers. It's a big house and those get-togethers usually involve my parents, my wife and two kids, my two brothers and their wives and children's also. Like I said, it's a big house. The first time I was able to make it down there, my wife and kids had gone separately with my folks, and when I arrived, my younger brother, who lives in the area, was there with his wife and daughter. We stayed up until about midnight or so, catching up and waiting for the arrival of our older brother who lives in Europe. Now I'll tell you right now that I did split a bottle of wine with my brother, and though I wish I could blame that awful night on the wine, alcohol doesn't work like that. As I mentioned, we were up until midnight. When it was time to bed down, instead of sleeping in the same room with my wife, I slept in my older brother's room, which is directly over the garage. For the record, this isn't unusual. I snore pretty badly, and so my wife and I have always slept in different rooms. Anyways, there's no clock in my brother's room, so I don't know what time it was, but at some point in the night I felt someone, or something, pulling and playing with my hair. I was sure someone was pranking me, and I remember getting mad, when all of a sudden I was pushed half out of the bed. I awoke with my legs on the bed and my face and hands on the floor. The only logical conclusion was that I'd fallen out of bed, so I shook it off and went out to the bathroom. When I came back to the bedroom, the absolute strangest feeling came over me, like something terribly evil was in the room. I can't really describe it, but climbing back into bed, I suddenly felt certain I'd been thrown out earlier. There was no way I'd done it myself. It was then that the whole damn bed rose off the floor. I was floating above the ground, on the bed, with the horrible feelings of doom and evil all around me. Awful female voices laughed and played with my hair, slapping the top of my head. The right front corner of the bed would slam onto the floor, only to lift back up into the air. Each corner of the bed would rock and hit the floor with a solid thud, all while the bed was elevated about a foot off the ground. I was completely paralysed with fear. I mean, I was scared to death. I began to pray to Jesus to help me, and as soon as I did, there emerged a voice clearly saying, Don't be afraid. I said, Make them stop. The response I got was chilling. There is only one, and it's not female. At that point, I inexplicably felt reassurance. My heart was pounding and I remember being told to calm down. I was told that moving the bed was no big deal, that it didn't want to make this thing powerful. The voice went on to say even I could move the bed any way I wanted to. All I had to do was think about it. And you know what? It worked. I was able to raise and lower the bed, turn it, whatever I wanted. Even though I had no frame of reference for what was happening, I began to calm down. The other entity, the good one, told me not to worry anymore, that me and my family would be protected. I said a prayer of thanks and believe it or not, fell into a wonderful sleep. At breakfast the next morning, 
I was subtly fishing around to see if anyone else had heard anything the night before, but nobody had. I couldn't believe it, and so I decided not to bring it up. Three days went by, and my older brother who owns the place started telling me about what a great deal he'd got on it, because the previous owner committed suicide, right there in the garage below his room, where I had slept that first night. I decided I had to tell him the story. Afterwards, he confessed that many renters had complained of nighttime visitors. For some reason, only myself. My wife, who did not believe my story until she heard the ghost late one night, and my sister in law have experienced this thing. My older brother privately admits that he believes me, but he has never experienced anything, and neither have his wife or kids. In fact, he told me if his wife ever finds out it's haunted, she'll make him sell it. Oh, and by the way, it's still available to rent, so keep that in mind if you're ever looking for a place to stay in Miami. Yeah, that's a hard pass. No, thank you, sir. This is another one of those, again, weird relationship things where I'm like, well, I got to keep it from my wife because if she finds out, you know, she'll send me to my room. <laughs> Don't tell my wife about the ghost. She has Until it's too to late. About. Well, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, I've seen that movie. Till I have to pull her down off the light fitting. <laughs> I just watched uh, Something in the Dirt, which is really, really good. It's uh, sort of a sci-fi horror film from the uh, directors of Resolution or The Endless, mm. Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. Brilliant mm. movie. Uh, but yeah, there's a scene where, I won't spoil anything, but someone literally ends up on the light fixture or close to it. And uh, I would, yeah, this is not an experience that I particularly need to have. Although I was thinking about this. This almost seems like dream logic stuff to me. Mm. You know, part of me thinks this is maybe, uh, yeah, there's like, an element of of dream involved yeah i think the bit where you're able to control the bed and what it does would seem yeah, that, to suggest that it's gone from an experience to they've passed out in fear and are now yeah. dreaming <laughs> personally <laughs> yeah i know that that was exactly my thought too it just it it seems a little too uh yeah a little too neat a little too as you say a little too dreamlike it, it reminded me though, there was, it, because it has the element of realism, it reminded me of a story that my, my new roommate told me uh, just before I came out to my, came back to Victoria and he is from Nicaragua and he was mm. telling me that he is uh, sort of a history of um, sleep paralysis experiences. Mm. And he said, particularly when he was younger, he used to use a lot of cocaine and he said it would be worse on the nights after he did that. You know, when yeah. he was younger, he used to party a lot. And what was interesting is, um, this isn't what I was intending to bring up, but this is part of it. You know, we, we think of sleep paralysis as like, oh, there's something on my chest. Therefore it's, you know, something in my heart and, and that's it. But he said his sleep paralysis experiences would always begin with pressure at the bottom of the bed. Mm. Like something was crawling up his body and Ooh. it would just sit on his chest, but it, it didn't start on his chest, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. But the other thing that the reason I bring it up is. During one of these sleep paralysis experiences, he was laying in bed and looking at the room, but he couldn't move. And there was something laughing at him, like something in his left ear yeah, sort of taunting him, but he couldn't quite make out what it was saying, but it was clearly meant to be taunting. It, it knew it had scared him. yeah. And I think he tried praying and he said, the thing is he was Catholic, but he didn't really believe. Mm. And this thing heard him praying and basically said something to the effect of, that's not going to help you. <laughs> and he looked up and he had a painting on his wall and the painting popped off the wall and rotated in the air, like spun 360 degrees in the air. Mm -hmm. And on the back of it, there was this little rope, like a little piece of string tied to the back of the, uh, the, yeah. the picture. And then it, it eventually just went back onto the wall. And he said, after the, eventually the sleep paralysis experience ended the way it always does, but for weeks, he couldn't decide whether that was a dream or it was real. And the only way he could make sure was to look at the back of that painting. And he couldn't make himself do it because he was afraid he would see that it did have the back, that string taped back there. Mm. Because he said he had never looked back there. The painting was there when he, when he moved in. Yeah. And finally, he worked up the nerve, turned it around, and it wasn't there. 
And he said, oh man, I just felt this huge wave of relief mm. because I realized then it was, it was probably a dream. And I thought, yeah, I mean, I, it, that makes as much sense as anything. Mm. But it, it also, I think maybe points to this possible manipulation of our sense of reality. Yeah. You know, that, that, that um, again, I, sometimes I, I wonder if maybe if dream is too, even though I do believe what we're talking about on this story is maybe partially dream based. Mm. I do wonder if there is also an element of we use the word dream because there's nothing else we can think of that adequately explains what we're trying to put across. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, it would be an extremely unique experience. I've never heard of anybody who's had a paranormal experience of that level able to sort of take control of it in that manner. And kind of rodeo ride the bed around the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I, again, it makes me think of, of dreams I've had where paranormal experiences are so vivid that you think, oh, well, there it is. It's real. And that, then this unreality sets in. Like, like I had this dream actually I, just after I got back to Victoria where I was living in a house, this old house, and there were these little gnome things all over the house and they were just hanging around, but we were actually cool with each other mm. and we were, it was all good, but I could see them. They like, they weren't hiding and we were just fine and we were chill. And I, I don't know, I, again, it was, it was definitely a dream, but it was interesting because it felt like this. It felt like, oh, in the dream, it felt very real, but also it, unreal because this, these things can't possibly be real, you know? But yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it, it is not, it is not lost on me that this was waiting for me when I got home. <laughs> and for our, for our listeners, I'm holding up my copy of, uh, Brett Manning's One Foot in the Green, which is her uh, her book about the good folk. And it's sort of a collection of writings and illustrations, which I very cleverly accidentally had shipped to Victoria and sent it to me in Montreal. So I'm going to be taking it back with me so I can read it. Well, that's why they were there. They were there we go, maybe. For you. I tell you, and, and Brett, I know you listen, so I hope you don't mind us uh, talking about you. But um, I, I actually wear her shirts when I travel. Because I consider her shirts good luck shirts. Mm. I've never had more positive reactions from people than when I'm wearing Brett's stuff. She sent me some stickers when I bought, uh, I bought a shirt from her recently. And I had lost my key card for my room in, in Montreal. And so when I got the new key card, one of the, I took one of the stickers she'd given me. And I put it on the new key card. <laughs> And I have not lost that key card and I will not because again, I, tr I truly think it's, it's, it, there is a good luck quality to it. So thank you, Brett, for, uh, <laughs> keeping my key card safe indirectly or directly, who knows? And, uh, yeah, as I say, I, I, I don't think it's an accident that this was waiting for me when I got back. Mm -hmm. And all your new friends. Hey, as long as we're cool with each other, that's fine. <laughs> I'm always up for new friends. It's when things were going badly that I was concerned. <laughs> All right, folks, that was our Miami show. It was very, uh, we got, well, we got skunk ape. We got some, uh, Biscayne Bay poltergeist action. Not too bad for a guy. For, I think for two guys who don't know a whole bunch about Miami, I think we did all right. Miami, despite being one of the most famous places in the States, doesn't seem to be overly haunted in specific location. I mean, there's loads of other bits around Florida that are known for being haunted. Fort Dade, especially. I wonder. If, because I, I found this when I looked for stories in New York as well, New York City. I wonder if a city reaches a certain size and it becomes hard to dis differentiate the signal from the noise. Mm. You know, because again, people seem to have this idea that, well, there has to be a lot of history and a lot of old history for there to be haunting. And also too, I think, you know, there's a, a large um, Spanish speaking population there as well. And, and you, you and I were talking about this in regard to reports, uh, Bigfoot reports from none of it or the lack thereof. Mm. And we were sort of speculating that this may partially be because, not because it's not happening, but because there's these cultural barriers that prevent, you know, these folks from going to the normal places where, you know, you and I might look for such reports. Mm. And I wonder if maybe there are maybe Spanish language resources for Miami that I just wasn't able to locate because I don't speak, uh, speak the language very well that uh, might have more because I don't know, it, it just seems like if with this concentration around Biscayne Bay, it seems like there must be more somewhere, but, but maybe not. 
Mm. I would not be surprised. And I would also suspect that a lot of the, the Spanish speaking residents would probably not want to share those with, with a, with a Western European audience because they're sick of being ignored or, or made to feel as though they're just embracing superstitious nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a big part of it too. You know, I, I, I think about that all the time in regard to the Four Corners region on the show. You know, mm-hmm. when we talk about, because people love to talk about skinwalkers and things like this, but I don't think they really spend much time investigating where those, the, where that comes from culturally. Mm. And, you know, I, I know people from those regions are not all that hot on discussing those things with outsiders, yeah. and which is totally fair because, you know, we, th- their culture has been exploited over and over and over. And I can imagine not wanting to contribute to that. Mm-hmm. So. Definitely. Folks, if you know of any hauntings from in and around Miami, we would love to hear from you. Let us know. Ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Uh, I, I imagine at some point we'll do a, a larger Florida show. Uh, I just, for whatever reason, Ghosts of Miami seemed to be the way it was going. And I, I, I quite enjoyed it and would love to do a second one. So again, if you have Miami stories, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Now we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hey there, listeners. Before you reach for that skip 15 seconds ahead button, I promise you this isn't an ad. We wanted to take a minute to talk to you about mental health. On this show, I've always tried to be as honest and open as possible about my struggles with depression and anxiety, because even though we've come a long way towards acknowledging the very real damage these things can do, there is still way too much lingering stigma about reaching out for help. And when you start to feel like there's no help, it's easy to start feeling like there's no hope. But Paul has joined me today to remind you there is always hope and there's always help. We're not going to try and talk you out of self-harming right now because we know that's not how it works. Instead, what we wanted to do was tell you something now and hope that should things get bad, you'll remember it and make a phone call or send a text message before you make any permanent decisions. As someone who knows all too well just how important mental health can be. It's never too late to reach out. In Canada, the number to call is 133-456-4566. In the USA, the new number to call is 988. That's 988. In the UK, the number to call is 116-123 or text SHOUT. That's S-H-O-U-T to 85258. In Australia, the number to call is 131114. However bad shit seems, it will pass. And no matter what your brain might be telling you at any given moment, and believe me when I say I know this intimately, there are people who love you and people who care deeply about how you treat yourself. Should a time come when you find yourself despairing, Please know that we've both been where you are, and there is a way back to the world. Take care. Welcome back. Thanks, as always, to Luke, Sarah, Anthony, Joseph, and everyone else who's part of the Ghost Story Guys family. Don't forget to check out Luke's podcast, Luke Lore, available on podcast players everywhere. And Joseph runs The Cardinal Rule on YouTube. That is a show about Arizona Cardinals football, and you can find him at The Cardinal Rule on YouTube and at AZ Sports Underground. Joseph and I also co-host the monthly YouTube live stream Weird Together, and that's about the latest and greatest in independent horror films. That will also be eventually a podcast all on its own sometime in the next coming months. So keep an eye out for that. I'll, I'll announce that on the show as well. And of course, thanks to you, you handsome devil, <laughs> my friend and co-host, the inimitable Paul Bestel, host of Mysteries and Monsters. Paul What's coming up on Eminem? Oh, strangely enough, this week's episode will also feature Brent Manning. Oh, talking, yeah, of course. <laughs> talking about One Foot in the Green and all kinds of strange 
experiences and creatures and uh, gateway into the weird with being scared by Bigfoot type creatures as children. So uh, that's a that's an interesting thing. Before I head off on a bit of a globe trotting run of episodes as I travel the world, finding scary stories from all over the place, and finally head to Scotland. Fabulous. And where can everyone find you online? You can find Mysteries and Monsters on all podcast platforms and across all social media networks, even the ones I don't want to be on. <laughs> For me, that's all of them. That's all the ones. I don't want to be on any of them. <laughs> but I'm still not on TikTok. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> I have an account. Like The show has an account. I just can't. Yeah. I don't know. I just can't. I can't do it because I can't do the blurry thing. Blurry? Th- I don't even know what that is. People, everybody on TikTok, they've obviously got this power of being blurry. I don't understand it. Nope. It, it, uh, it's, it's, you know what? I think Sasquatch teaches a class on that. Ah, of course. It's obvious. Yeah. Got to give him a call. <laughs> oh, I had to do a big... I, I uh, went to see a nine-year-old on Sunday whose birthday it was my friend's son and, and obviously made the uh, fantastic decision to buy him a Minecraft axe, <laughs> uh, which he th- thought was amazing. And uh, I had to do an impression of Bigfoot talking. Amazing. And it was a hit, I assume. Oh yeah, it was brilliant. I had them rolling in the aisles, even the cats. I I, I think we should just release that as its own ringtone. Yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Patrons, you're going to you're going to get a, a, a an MP3 file of Paul making that noise. I'm going to clip it out just like now, and you can make that your text ringtone. That is that is the <laughs> done deal. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as largely the truth. And you can find my podcast, Largely the Truth with Brennan Store, everywhere fine podcasts live. That's an interview show. I uh, haven't done a new episode in a while, but there's a lot of great conversations archived there. And also, you can listen to Transmissions from the Void anywhere podcasts live. You can also listen to it on this feed, but you know, you can listen to it there as well. It's fun. And like I said, also Weird Together. That's a monthly live stream on YouTube. And that's where me and Joseph Camo talk about the latest and greatest in independent horror. And of course, as we said at the top of the show, if you want to join the Patreon team, head to patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. That's patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. A dollar a month gets you in the door. They get you ad-free episodes. But beyond that, we've got all kinds of cool stuff. There is There are physical rewards, which I finally shipped, and we're all, I'm all caught up. And of course, there's digital rewards. There's bonus shows, all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, this episode alone. Paul and I have been talking for uh, four hours and 15 minutes by the time all this is done. And I would say there's probably about an hour and a half of bonus material. Maybe a, maybe an hour for uh, <laughs> carefully curated bonus material. <laughs> or censored. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't want to use the word, but yeah, that is probably more accurate. And again, you can find that at patreon.com slash ghost story, guys. Also, we've got a, by the time this comes out, two days after this comes out, we'll be having our uh, me and Paul live, uh, live chat with, with patrons at the $10 level and above. So there's, uh, when, by the time this comes out, there's still time for that. So again, patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Yes. I might be dressed as a vicar again for that particular episode. Hallelujah. I couldn't think of a good way to say <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and wear a different jumper for that episode. I'll just remember to wear a shirt. Am I wearing pants? You won't <laughs> I'll just wear clothes for a change. Don't stifle my creative drive, Paul. I can see how cold it is. I know that much. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Don't stand up, man. Ah! <laughs> Folks, this is why you're glad it's not a video show. <laughs> uh, Paul, any appearances coming up? Uh, not just yet. I've got a couple in the pipeline. Okay. So I'm just waiting for confirmation of dates at the moment. I uh, don't have any podcast appearances coming up, but on May 20th, I will be at Little Ghost Books in Toronto from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. I'm not on the bill, but I, I will be in attendance. The event is um, it is an event honoring the novelist Andrew Piper hmm. and Steve Stred, who's a friend of the show, who may be on the show at some point as a storyteller, hopefully in the coming months. Steve is hosting it. The, the event is in honor of Andrew and I've been invited. So I, I will be there. If you want to come hang out, you should, because those are two really cool guys and it's going to be a good time. So again, that's May 20th, 5 to 7 PM at Little Ghost Books in Toronto, Ontario. And uh, yeah, come by, say hi and support two 
really great fucking Canadian authors and me who will be there hopefully at the snack table. <laughs> and uh, don't forget, if you guys like cold weather horror, grab yourself a pre-order of Steve Stred's new book, Churn the Soil. Again, uh, Steve is a wonderful guy. Uh, turns out, you know, again, we met each other randomly through Twitter. It turns out we grew up an hour apart. We had no idea. And uh, yeah, Churn the Soil. I, I just got an advanced copy from Steve. It's fucking great. And I, I don't say that just because he sent it to me. I said, because it's great. It's cold weather horror. Think like the thing or uh, 30 days of night, really great book. And uh, yeah, you can get that at uh, mybook.to slash turn the soil or by checking the link in the show notes. And again, that's just uh, it's super cheap. I think it's 99 cents on Kindle right now. And it's, it's a great read. So if you like horror fiction, if you like genre fiction, grab your copy of churn the soil and hopefully we'll have Steve on the show at some point in the coming months to tell some stories with us. If you want to pick up some Ghost Story Guys merch, head to our website, ghoststoryguys.com. Follow the links there to our Public and Redbubble stores. Again, the uh, website slash store is almost ready to launch, but for now, you'll just follow the links. Again, that's ghoststoryguys.com for all your GSG swag needs. Shout out again to our composer, Rainy Days for Ghosts. Rainy Days for Ghosts is a project of film journalist and composer Jerry Smith. You can find Jerry's music streaming as Rainy Days for Ghosts everywhere. You get your tunes, and if you want to hire Jerry, shoot him an email at rainydaysforghosts at gmail.com. Our theme song, Radio, Into the Darkness We Go, is composed and performed by Peter Kursov of Pizanta Music. Find more from him at nightharvestrecordings.com or by searching for Pizanta Music wherever you get your tunes. Also, check out that compilation album I mentioned at the top of the show. You'll find a link in the show notes. Our story's theme is The Future Belongs to Them Now by Hexagram. Find more from them by searching for Hexagram wherever you get your music. Remember, that's Hexagram with two X's, not three. I guess that's going to do it. Well, we'll be back in two weeks. But until then... Into the darkness we go. I just knew Miami Vice existed. I knew Crockett and Tubbs the end. <laughs> hmm, that sounded a little too chipper. <laughs> Jesus, store. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The trumpets. <laughs> Didn't miss a beat. No, no, I'd say. <laughs> Professional, baby. Here's your beating heart. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 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 now, what if I just hold here? Will he think it's frozen? <laughs> Paul does the Sierra sound. I could do an album. You really could. <laughs> I want to hear Bigfoot doing the classics. So like my way.